Hi, it's Kernatex here again with the ninth video in a series about in installing and maintaining Gen 2 Linux. So in the um, previous eight videos we've seen how we've installed uh, Gen 2 from a base system um, and then a lot of the videos I've been showing how to install various packages such as the desktop environment and a few of the large packages um, which are quite useful. Uh, in this video I'm going to be showing you how to update um, Gen 2 and it's, it's probably what the, um, the meat of what you'll be doing as far as maintenance of uh, Gen 2 will be. Um, occasionally you want to add a new package or remove one possibly but most of the time you'll be updating the system um, it's also something you probably wouldn't want to do each day um, probably weekly would be sufficient I, I tend to vary on some of my machines between several days to maybe a fortnight also you don't want to leave it too long because the um, system can become so out of date it's incredibly hard to get the update to work and the reason is that Gen 2 is not a versioned distribution if you like so whereas you might get um, say Ubuntu or Fedora uh, released as a particular version and six months or a year later you might get the next version released they're like milestones if you like with Gen 2 the um, distribution is effectively updated daily in fact I could probably push it to say hourly the the repository is updated roughly hourly so in theory you could you could update every hour um, you wouldn't want to for several reasons a because the amount of time it would take you'd probably be emerging and compiling forever if you did that um, and also when you sync with the repository if you're syncing with an external repository it's frowned upon that you shouldn't um, sync more than once a day um, and certainly no more than two um, so as I say maybe, maybe every few days maybe once or twice a week I'd say is probably a good good compromise and, and at the very most maybe every fortnight uh, depending on your workload and so on and how keen you are to keep the system up to date so there's um, two tools really to synchronize the repository um, what I'm going to do is show you both of them but I'm going to stick to the one that I use mostly because it's got some or it enables some extra features and it means we need to install another package so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a snapshot of the current um, state of the machine which is as it was after we installed Wesnoth in the last video so to do that you just highlight this you can right click here and do take or you can click the take button at the top so I'm just going to take a snapshot and give it um, a good description okay so we've got this snapshot we can go back back to at any time so I'm going to start this machine off now And what I'll do the first time round is show um, the standard way of syncing the repository, which is what we've already done actually when we first installed stage three at the very beginning. Did an emerge sync command then, and that's basically what we're going to do now. So it's really just a reminder of the standard way of syncing the repository. Okay, so let's get rid of that. Don't need the KDE stuff anymore. So I've cut the root, and all we do is emerge minus minus sync. And what this does, it uses rsync to get the changes from the sync repository um, and it updates the local repository. So if you remember it, uh, when we did just before we did the Wesnoth, we did an update command, and there's no new ch no new packages or no no changes that were coming in. After this command, I'm hoping there will be some changes. 
and they'll be the updates to the whole of the uh, Gen 2 system. So you can see it's going through each category and each um, package is being updated, various metadata is being updated about each package. And obviously the longer you leave it between updates then this has got more changes to bring in. So it will take slightly longer. It, ge it generally takes two to three minutes depending on speed of your connection and speed of the hard disk as well. Okay, and that's it. It's updated and it's also pulled in a new news item for us. Important thing to check is that the return code is zero, saying that showing that the sync was successful. If there's anything other than that, then you need to investigate why the sync wasn't successful, maybe retry the sync. But as I say, bear in mind that you don't really want to sync more than once a day if you can help it. Um, I, I intend to do another video on maintaining your own sync mirror which would enable you to um, have a server that syncs up using a cron job automatically say at night time and then each one of your machines that you've got Gen 2 installed on you can um, configure it to sync with your own mirror so then um, it means that you can sync as many times as you like assuming your mirror is correct which you know occasionally it might might go wrong for some reason but very very rarely it means you can sync as many machines as you want to your heart's content to your own mirror without fear of being having your IP address blocked so um, if you remember I, I have actually already configured this to sync to my own local mirror which is why I'm able to show you the two syncs the two ways of syncing so I won't have that problem but now if I after that let me just uh, read this news item that's appeared so I need to do e-select news list just to see what is in there and it's number 21 21 right okay that's quite a lot there a great deal Oh, right, okay, this is quite interesting. Um, so what this is saying, the looks of it, is that the, if you remember at the beginning, we, we configured to use profile 17.0. Uh, 13.0 is a previous stable one, but there was two stable versions. There was, in fact, these two stable versions. And there was also 17.1, which was like an experiment or, or development profile which um, wasn't re recommended for everyday use it looks like they've now set that to stable and this is the procedure for updating to that 17.1 so um, that might be something to go through as well um, 
Okay, so what I'm going to do, and I won't set that to unread because we're going to crash this and restore the snapshot and do this again with the other sync command. But basically, if I do a uh, update command, you'll see now that this will identify changes that have come in with that synchronization. Okay, so yes, there is some changes. If we look through, uh, most of them will be um, actual update commands, which is indicated by the capital U. And there are some new packages, probably because the updates depend on new dependencies, new packages being available. So, and you can see also some uh, reloads And it says here the reason being, for, uh, sorry, rebuilds. So it's saying the update to Poplar is causing a rebuild to these packages, which kind of points that these packages make use of Poplar, but Poplar, because, but because that's been updated, uh, these packages also need to be rebuilt to hook into that new version. So they must have some sort of static link to, to the dependent. The dependency. Um, okay, so I've noticed, unfortunately, <laughs> two of the largest packages that we've installed are due to be updated. They're affected by updates. So you can see that we've currently got installed LibreOffice 6.2.4.2. Sorry, we've currently got installed 6.1.5.2, and there's a new version 6.2.4.2 uh, to come in. Um, and likewise, basically Chromium 7.3.0 is the currently installed version and there's a 74.0 pending to be installed as an update. So, and Inkscape as well, that's not one of the bigger ones, but it did take a little while. Um, So I think, yeah, actually, what I think I might do is uninstall those, and that would be a good demonstration of what you've got to do when you uninstall a package. Um, okay. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll do no to this. I'm just going to crash out of this now. Just shut it right down. Because what I'm going to do is right-click this snapshot, and I'm going to click on Restore to restore it the snapshot to uh, sorry s s restore the uh, 
virtual machine to how it was prior to uh, those changes I've just done with the update. Um, and I don't want to create a snapshot of the current mach machine state, so I'll just click restore. So that's restored it, and I'll just restart this now. As you can see the virtual machine does have its advantages if you've not used a virtual machine before where you can save snapshots and retry things. It's just a bit annoying that it's so slow. It's been an unbelievably slow with Gen 2, unfortunately. Okay, so as you can see we're back again. We've got the Wesnos tab up, so I'll get rid of that, get rid of the wiki tab, and become root. So what the other way of syncing is is by using an additional um, package called EIX and um, associated tools that come with that package and what it allows you to do is to um, EIX as far as I understand creates a database and maintains a database of the uh, repository and these tools allow you to interrogate that database so you can do searches and queries a lot quicker a bit like the um, eQuery in a way There's there's loads of little tools that sort of kind of do the same thing but in different ways and certain tools have their own advantages but EIX is quite nice, quite a nice tool to use. Um, so if we emerge EIX first of all. Okay, you can see it's part of the app portage category again. Okay, so um, now we've got this EIX installed. The thing we need to do first of all, and this is what you do every time to update the or to synchronize the repository, is um, EIX sync. Um, and we'll just check that. Yeah, that's right. I'm just checking to make sure that the database doesn't need to be initialized, but this does do the initialization of a brand new database as well as updating it so it should identify that the EIX database doesn't exist yeah in fact it says straight away so it has identified it so what it does first of all it creates the database so this is a bit you won't see each time that's that's uh, brand new but you will see that being done at the end of the synchronization and as you can see it's running merge sync itself and then what it'll do is it'll populate the database with the changes so you can see this bit's the same as we did before with um, Emerge Sync.
Okay, so that's finished. And what you can see straight away, the difference is that if I scroll up, hopefully there's enough scroll buffer, at the end of the synchronization, which is here, it's um, updated the, uh, yeah, the database here. So th this bit was all the same as is all part of the Emerge Sync. And you can see the return code there is zero, as we saw before. And this bit is the bit where it backs up the previous database and then updates the database with the changes that came in on sync. And then also what it does, it runs another tool called EIX diff and it shows the differences between the um, current installation and what would be updated. So you can see we've got a U here and it shows what the update is. And likewise, there's the LibreOffice that's going to be updated. So 6152 is the currently installed one, and it's going to be uh, updated to 6242. Um, so there's a change for Spider Monkey there as well. And somewhere will probably be Chrome as well. Probably see that somewhere or other. And indeed, there it is there. So there's 73. Dot zero is being updated to 74.0 and there's Opera as well so it gives you a sort of preview of what what uh, is going to be updated not only that it shows you what updates have occurred for packages you haven't installed which may be useful sometimes you see things you think oh that's quite an interesting thing I'll install that and have a go at that see if that's uh, going to be useful for me and just gives you a little update on the uh, how long things took and then if I bring back the update command oh yes that's that's one problem I find with the EIX sync is that things like these messages here about reading news items unfortunately they appear right at the top here before the diff occurs so if it says something like portage or portage is recommended to be updated or um, like this is a news item, you don't see that at all. So you have to sometimes remember to scroll back to see if there is anything that is mentioned, which is a little bit annoying sometimes I find. So just wait for this update to finish and you should be able to see that the, if you've not seen already actually from these lines here but you should see that the uh, changes have been identified are the same as uh, the e uh, emerge sync that we did just a little bit earlier And there you go, you can see there's the same packages, the same rebuilds that are going to be installed. There's those two new packages at the top there. So um, I'm not going to install these at the moment. Um, what I am going to show you is something that's worth bearing in mind. Um, at the moment we've updated the repository tree so we've got pending updates to install 
Um, and one thing you can't do after you've done a, done a sink like this is you can't do a depth clean because it says there are pending changes. Basically, you wouldn't know what to depth clean without damage the system, damaging the system. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is because if I, well, I'm going to uninstall these big packages just so the update doesn't have to rebuild and we we'll spend another 24 hours um, waiting for t these two packages to, to build. They took roughly 10, 11 hours each, as I remember. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you that you can't do a depth clean up, up after a sink, and then I'm going to restore the snapshot, get rid of these packages, then do a depth clean, then do a sink, and then do the update in that order, which is is, is the best order to do it in. Because otherwise, also, some of the files that are going to be depth cleaned, they could be updated, and then we just immediately delete them. So it's kind of crazy doing it that way. So I'll show you that you can't depth clean. It will come up with a warning. And in fact, it says here, depth clean will not remove any packages unless all the required dependencies have been resolved. And they haven't, because we've just run this effectively this command. But we haven't. Oh, okay. There's nothing to do because we haven't. Uh, yeah, because it's it's not identified anything to remove. If it identified something to remove, it would it refuse to move it. So I should be if I do. Uh, depth clean. Chromium, for example. So you can see it's identified the um, version that we've got installed and if for some reason you had two versions installed it would omit, well it might try to delete both of them unless you specifically said I want to delete Chromium-73.0 and the ones that get omitted, uh, the versions are put here in green. So I'm going to press enter to accept that. So this will uninstall Chromium. Now if I rerun the deck clean on its own, oh, I'm now expecting it to fail. Oh no, it is going to do it. Okay, I'm a little confused by that. Normally it wouldn't. I must have missed out something and normally wouldn't do this. Okay, in that case, what I'm going to do is remove the other big packages and just go straight for the update then. Uh, so I'm going to do LibreOffice and Inkscape. Opera is quick. The other dependencies shouldn't take too long. In fact, this, the dependencies are probably reduced because we're getting rid of some of the packages that probably use these. So let's get rid of LibreOffice and Inkscape. So this is basically how you remove packages. So I'm not, I don't want to use Chromium anymore, and I don't want to use LibreOffice, and I don't want to use Inkscape anymore. And notice that there's, I don't know how many, perhaps about a dozen packages there due for removal. Well, there'll be a lot more after we've uninstalled these two. And also notice it says there's 1,249 packages installed. And oh, there you go, 21 to remove. So now if you run that clean, there'll be a, quite a few more. And there you go, it's uh, identified all the dependencies that these three packages were using. Um, and it's always, as I say, always worth doing minus A or minus P to check that, to 
just double check what's going to be uninstalled make sure there's something that you'd expect or you need installed um, make sure it's not going to be removed in which case you need to either modify your depth clean command or maybe alter the configuration in some way so I'll just press enter to get rid of all those Okay, so that's finished removing those dependencies. Again, from the merge, you need to read the output. So this one's saying there's some sim links that may need to be retained, but it's identified that they're safe to remove, so there's nothing to do there. Then it says you appear, appears you're removing your system virtual machine. Please run eselect Java virtual machine list to list all available VMs, then use eselect Java VM set system. So I think this is because LibreOffice uses Java. Um, I don't think this is going to work because we didn't have any other Java VM. In fact, no, it doesn't. So there's nothing to do there either. Uh, so the last thing we need to do is just a rev depth rebuild. Make sure there's nothing that needs to be rebuilt from reverse dependencies. Okay, so we've deleted them, so now we can do the update without fear. Of, uh, by the way, I've only deleted these. A, A to show you how to delete the packages, but B just to make the update a lot quicker. Otherwise, let's say it'll be like 20 odd hours doing doing the update on this virtual machine, which um, yeah, it's just ridiculous now. 
Um, so just before I do the update, just show you a couple of commands that you can do with EIX. Um, you could do something like EIX uh, GCC, for example, and what it does, it lists all the packages that have got GCC mentioned in them. So you can see how quick that was. It was almost instantaneous. Um, if you're interested in what's installed, you can do minus I GCC, and it shows you the um, packages that are installed that match that GCC string. So you can see there's two programs. There's the actual GNU compiler and a config file as well. So it's, there's, there's quite a few other options, but they're, they're perhaps the most useful options. So, okay, let's go onward to do the update itself. In fact, let's reduce this down to four jobs. Okay, yeah, that's reduced the uh, number of packages to be installed down quite a bit, and I don't think any of these take too long to install either. So I'm going to let that update work, let it go ahead, and wait five, ten minutes for that to complete.
Okay, so those have installed those updates, so just check the messages again. And we can see that it's saying check that we've got LVM in the boot. I think we've already done this, so we can just do a nice update. I'll do this in another window, so don't interrupt that message output. You see LVM is set to start at the boot time, so that's okay. Print the cups, we're not using USB, so there's no worries about having that enabled in the kernel, we can leave that. That's just some information about text live. And so that's the update done, we've just got to do the usual thing of do the merge deck clean in case the update caused any packages to become orphaned. There's nothing there, and finally I'll do a ref deck rebuild minus p. And it's actually found something that needs to be rebuilt. So this doesn't happen so much now, but occasionally it does happen. And you can see that these are the packages that will rebuild. So to actually do the rebuild, we just remove the P and tell RevDet Rebuild to actually do the rebuilding of those three packages.
okay so that is the system all up to date now so that'll be it for now until you did the next sync um, to look for the next updates but as I say maybe once or twice a week is more than sufficient to do that you wouldn't want to do it definitely not on the same day and at the very most once every day um, while I was finishing I just remembered there is an option if you want to build the Chromium web browser yourself um, called Jumbo Build um, and as you see the little tooltip there says combine source files to speed up build process um, I believe I think I'm correct in saying that it will nearly half the time it takes to build but you do need quite a lot of memory to allow that to to be beneficial otherwise you'll just end up um, using the swap file and you could potentially make the build even slower um, I'll show that you in with eQuery uh, there it is there combined source file speed up build process it does make a difference if you've got memory available so that's that's worth bearing in mind um, so I think that is more or less it um, yeah I can't think of anything else to mention but yeah it's down to you now if you uh, decide to install this on a real machine as so I've been using Gen 2 for probably around about 10 years um, find it very enjoyable package to use uh, sorry distribution to use um, occasionally it can be a bit bit onerous when you've got a huge update if you have left it a while so it is worth doing it regularly but um, other than that it's uh, yeah nice package if also that's something else I wanted to mention if you need help the best place to go to that is the Gen 2 forums um, there's some very very good uh, oh, I'm not sure which link it is, is it that one yeah that's it uh, very intelligent people on there the devs are on there um, moderators obviously very helpful I've, I've had occasion to use them once or twice to help out with some queries that I've had um, and you they're very good as I say they don't speak down to you or anything they help you along they'll ask you know if you don't provide the correct information they'll ask you and show you what commands to run to to get the correct information so don't hesitate to to post um, you know any queries you have there specific queries with Gen 2 itself so I hope you've enjoyed the series of videos I hope you found it beneficial and useful and um, uh, honestly I hope you do become another Gen 2 user so thank you very much for watching and uh, that's it for now see you on another video very soon and goodbye for now